What's going on, guys? Welcome into the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Taglier, and man, do we have a fun show for you guys today. As most of you guys know, the NFL Combine is taking place this weekend, which means our families will likely feel like it's the middle of the NFL season all over again. It's obviously an important event for a lot of players and teams, so we thought, what better way to talk about this important event than with one of the most important and smartest gentlemen in the business? My good friend, Mr. Sigmund Bloom. Sig, what's going on, man? Oh, just enjoying a very stimulating off season. And, and that's what's fun is the wheels never stop turning in our heads. The wheels never stop turning in the NFL. And you know, just as we're absorbing, just like during the season, just as we're absorbing the latest thing to happen, something new happens that we have to, to analyze and, and make fit together. And I, I think we're just experiencing the first little droplets of rain of the storm that's going to come with free agency. And then the draft. And the draft is just so engrossing. And, and just like every year, it's, it's a joy to get to know these prospects because it sets the stage for what's to come. I'll tell you what, it's always amazing this time of the year that I'm able to retain as much information as I am in such a short time. Because it's like, if you were to ask me to learn, like, you know, when you meet someone in person and, and sometimes you have to meet them a few times to remember their name. I'm I'm now like, you know, 120 players into my process, Sig, where it's like, I am shocked that I remember all the names that I do at this point. Like after, you know, a couple months of watching some film, but it, it's been a busier month of the off season than I thought it probably would be. But I did manage to get out this weekend. I mean, we had our first date night in like months. Nice. It felt good to talk with another couple live in person. I mean, Sig, do you ever get the feeling in season like, ah, uh, like when, when once you finally get out, like this is what most people do throughout August and January. Right, right. Yeah, like this is what normal people do. And we've been lucky enough to put an obsession and call it a job. So, but then when we have as you said, adult conversations about things other than football, yeah. it can be a little jarring to ch- change the topic, but it can also be refreshing. Absolutely. And the, I mean, the reason I wanted Sig on for this podcast, I knew we had to get him on for the draft because the NFL draft is one of those things where the very like the, the opinions vary so much. It's, it's whether or not that player's skill will translate, you know, what team they're going to land on. How is he going to fit in with that team? And there is nobody in the industry that I know more, Sig, that that is willing to take that contrarian point of view to say to say something that is looked out, looked at as, you know, off the wall. That, that might be a, a different thought. You know, so many people just go along with the mainstream thought process you're not outside you're not afraid to go outside that box so let me ask you up front let's just say the NFL draft class right now how do you feel about this class translating into fantasy is there anybody that that people are missing out there that may not be a big name that you know should pop up on your radar well I think the to take the, the questions um the first question about how this is going to translate quarterback continues to become worth less and less in fantasy leagues but Lamar Jackson much like Uh, Deshaun Watson last year has an opportunity to set the bar very high. The best athlete we've seen at quarterback Mm -hmm. since Michael Vick and an underrated passer, no matter what anybody says. This is a running back class as good as or maybe even slightly better than last year's class, which is was the best class we had seen since 2008. So rookie running backs and redraft leagues are going to be a big deal, but also hitting on your picks in your dynasty drafts are going to be big. The wide receiver class has a handful maybe three guys that have true number one potential not that there are 32 true number one wide receivers in the NFL mm-hmm. that might not even be 16 or even 10 right. but yeah. uh, it, it doesn't you know you don't have the marquee even less so than last year but you have a lot of players that can be contributors and then we see how a you know contributor depending on the surrounding offense can be a, 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 an instant impact player like Cooper Cup last year you know mm-hmm. if, if Cooper Cup had gone to the Bills instead of Zay Jones we might not be talking about Cooper Cup at all, but because he went to the Rams, which we had to, that's a whole other layer of this is forecasting how teams are going to change with all of the coaching changes. We have a ton of new offensive coordinators. Mm -hmm. Um, And the tight end class, look, last year's class was an historic class. And all the rookie tight ends rarely make a big impact. We're going to see that year two, year three. This isn't quite as good of a class, um, but at the same time, there's absolutely names that we need to know. Uh, As as far as players that I, I, I think aren't necessarily getting enough love right now i mean i like uh people are talking a lot about dallas uh go to the, the tight end out of south dakota state but i love jake weineke the wide receiver um i i think that he, he, there there's a lot to his game that's going to translate and there's a lot of receivers in this class that are big and can win those contested balls and have some underrated athleticism for how big they are i i think weineke fits extremely well in that group uh, running back uh you know there, there's all of the the 
typical, you know, people are going to know the top 10 or 12 names in and out. Um, you know, going a little further down the list, though, Edo Smith from Southern Miss, who we're not even mm-hmm. going to see at the Combine, he fits really well in this NFL that's going to utilize two or three backs in the backfield instead of one. Um, he's one of my favorite guys from lower down in the list, but we won't get a chance to see how he stacks up. Um, Rock Thomas from Jacksonville State. Jacksonville State actually has three draftable players this year. You know, He's a player with a lot of a real bursty back that I think for the combine is extremely important for small school players. And this, and Wynicke comes into this conversation too, um, to show, because on their tape, you can get an impression of them, but you know that they're, you're also comparing them to players that likely don't have an NFL future at the combine, you have a chance to compare them side by side with players who obviously have an NFL future. Yeah. And that's the biggest thing is for me with the combine. I'm not sure with how you are with numbers, Sig, when it comes to like models and, and, and like, you know, the metrics of these players. But my bet, my favorite thing at the combine is just watching these players next to each other, go through the drills, yes. see the fluidity that they're running routes, looking at their hands, how, how natural they look like. You could see at the combine last year that Christian McCaffrey was a natural hands catcher. He could have been out there with the wide receivers running drills, catching balls the way he kind of floats across the air as he catches the ball, gets up in the air. And it's something that I know one of your favorites, John Kelly from Tennessee, uh, he does that extremely well. I think he's one of the best. Yeah. Uh, he may be the best pass catching running back in this draft. And, you know, we might talk about him as we go through this, because, you know, what we've been doing recently has been covering the NFL draft, the prospects in it over the last couple of weeks, as I mentioned, giving you an idea as to the players names you might hear called, you know, during the first few na- uh, first few rounds of the draft and those who are going to make an impact in fantasy football. Today, we're going to talk about some of those players who are performing at the combine, as well as some that might have more to prove than others. If we do have time, we may even touch on some of the defensive players players that I can't wait to see. Some of those guys are going to make a big impact in this league, so hopefully we'll have some time to get to them. Before we do, I I want to remind you guys that we've had the if you have not had the chance yet, go and sign up to win that full-size signed Le'Veon Bell helmet. Uh, If you haven't yet, go to fantasypros.com forward slash contest to enter. It's free, so why not do it? Uh, The helmet is courtesy of sportsintegrity.com, where you can go to get certified memorabilia for all your favorite sports franchises, not just sports either. I always like to go and check them out and see what's the neatest, you know, non-sports item. And today I found a signed gi, you know, like uh, the martial arts uniform, a uh, signed gi by Ralph Macchio inscribed the Karate Kid. So I thought that was really neat. They have some awesome stuff over there at sportsintegrity.com, who's been in the business now for 17 years. Go ahead and check them out. Again, that's sportsintegrity.com. Now, Sig, let's start talking about the combine and some of the things to watch, because that's ultimately what this episode is to talk about, you know, things to watch for at the combine. Before I start with my checklist of things that I have, is there one thing that you in particular you cannot wait to see at the combine? I love the drills, like you were saying, because uh, it, it's, a, it's sort of similar when you go to the all-star game practices, where mm-hmm. seeing players one after another on the same field doing the same thing, it, it necessarily not necessarily to sort them in terms of a ranking, but just to really understand the different qualities of a player, the different styles of athleticism, as you were alluding to, the, the idea of the things that they do well without even thinking about it, the things that come naturally to them. Those things really present themselves almost by osmosis, just by sitting and letting the the reps of watching these players go through these drills one after another wash over you. And it isn't necessarily something I think that the NFL is going to use to separate them on the draft board, but it is a, a great thing towards the ends of you know what the work that you and I and many others are doing right now is really understanding these players and what they have to offer the NFL leading into the draft. So we understand the significance whenever a team decides to take a player and how high they decide to take a player. Do you have a favorite position to watch while you're, you know, like, let's let's, let's get yeah. on offense now. Do you have a favorite position to watch? The gauntlet with wide receivers is always fun. Yeah. Um, I mean, because again, that's that, you can't think about it when you're doing it. It's And that's the beautiful thing about the gauntlet is, is it forces players, it, much like a game situation, it forces them into a situation where uh, they can't just rely, like, because here's the thing. You know, I'll, 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 you know, one of the dirty secrets or something that may demystify the combine for some folks. Uh, when, when we watch the combine, there will be some players that the results of the testing are really important, maybe because we're trying to see if they get everything back from an injury, maybe because they're a small school player, um, maybe because it allows them to answer questions about some deficiencies they've had on tape. But at the same time, mm-hmm. how a player runs at game speed versus pad uh, versus uh, time speed is, is 
a, a question where you always throw out the time speed if it doesn't agree with what you see in game speed. Yes. And I, I think the, the key here with the, some of these drills is, I mean, we went and covered this at Travel Gaines Place like 10 years ago now out in California, where players that are training for the combine are specifically training to ace these drills. So there's a technique to running a 40 where you might be able to shave a tenth of a second off of your time by holding your hands correctly or, or the start. That doesn't make you a better football player. It doesn't make you a faster football player. It just makes your result better. And I get why they put the time and energy into it. It's hiring somebody to coach you up, someone like Travel to coach you up for the combine and getting those numbers can move you up the board and, and earn you money and, and, and make people talk about you. But it, 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 the parts of the combine where they're doing football things interest me a little more than the, the results of the combine with the exception of those players that have something to prove. Amen. That's I, I couldn't have put it better myself, honestly. Like that's the thing is the how I view about the, you know, the 40 times and some of the agility drills they have to do that are timed. I don't think you ever want to see your player in the bottom tier of that in those numbers, but just because you're at the top doesn't necessarily mean it's going to translate, you know, to the NFL. I, I think that you mentioned it. Uh, you said that, you know, it can help that their draft stock. And I think it did that with John Ross last year. They saw him run at the 40, 422. And it, it's not to say that John Ross is, is dead in the water because I actually happen to like John Ross an awful lot. But had John Ross not, you know, gotten to the four twos, would he have been drafted in the top 10? Probably not. I, I mean, these things do affect draft stock, and that's why we pay attention to them. But I think it's more important to watch them, as you mentioned, you know, doing these drills side by side next to the other players. So let's start right at the quarterback position. Every quarterback, you know, all the big name quarterbacks are going to be at the combine. They're going to be participating in the drills. I think where we should start here are the two players who I think have the biggest question marks about their accuracy. And that has to do with Josh Allen. Uh, you know, Mel Kuyper has obviously talked about him going number one, which I think that's bat stuff crazy. Like, I don't think that there's a chance that Josh Allen goes number one. I think that this is all this is all hype. And I think that's going to come dying down after the combine because, you know, Josh Allen, he has some special tools. I feel like we've seen that before, but his his accuracy is consistently awful. Uh, he can make some throws that nobody else can, but you cannot teach accuracy the way that some players can throw the ball. Uh, and Lamar Jackson out of, out of Louisville, you, you mentioned his name earlier. One of the best athletes I think we've ever seen play the quarterback position, maybe even the best. Michael Vick came out and said that he's probably a better athlete than I was. And it's kind of ridiculous. Crazy fast uh, delivery. In the pocket, he stands a little fat, flat-footed sometimes. His accuracy has been, I think his accuracy has been better than Josh Allen, uh, but I think that there's areas to improve with Lamar Jackson, but I, I think the upside is there. But with those two players, is there a, like, how do you feel about those two players? Sure. Like, are you looking forward to seeing them? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think that, for Josh Allen, uh, this is going to he's going to continue to be and in some ways. This applies to both of them, but especially Josh Allen, an eye of the beholder uh, kind of quarterback prospect. And I also think that Josh Allen is a terrific prospect to show the divergence between draft Twitter, if you will, or our our our, mm -hmm. our, our draft analyst industry that we love being part of and big draft or the NFL or the, 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 the league insiders, the decision makers, because they see traits. They see the arm, they see the size, they see at least some like leadership fearlessness, put the team on your back kind of tendencies. Uh, and of course, they're going to believe in their abilities to unlock what's there. And because he fits in the classic mold of an NFL quarterback, it even reminds me a little bit of Joe Flacco, where I remember watching Joe Flacco at Delaware. I remember watching Joe Flacco at the Senior Bowl and saying, well, uh, you know, I see, I, I can see, but I was surprised Baltimore took him as high as they did because it's it's the size, it's the arm talent, uh, arm strength, and believing that you're you're going to be able to build around that, and that's I think still a prevailing view from a lot of NFL offensive minds. But as you're saying about the accuracy, like he just, I think the one of the ways that's been stated that's really a easy, a well stated way to put it is he misses layups on the field. You know? Yeah. And that's one of those things where you say coaches will say, well, we can start ironing those things out where some of us evaluating quarterbacks say that's not something that's going to go away. That's not something you, you coach uh, into a player. I mean, and you can talk about mechanics, although I believe that mechanics follow mindset. There's some more questions about Lamar Jackson and his mechanics and how that can affect his accuracy. But much like Josh Allen, and maybe we're getting into a, a, a new era in the NFL where, okay, you can build around size and arm strength, but why can't you build around 
blinding speed. Yes. And and, and incorporate that into your offensive mindset. Mm-hmm. I oh, think. Go ahead. Oh, no. I, I, that's the thing is Lamar Jackson. That's the thing is like the I think that there's two differing sides on him. Some people believe he can't be a quarterback. Some people say that he could be one of the best. I think there's a middle ground here. And I think it really comes down to landing spot. If he lands with an offensive coordinator that can work with him and, and actually understands his strengths and builds the offense around his actual players. Lamar Jackson's going to be a real weapon in the NFL. If he lands with a John Fox, he's going to die. <laughs> That's right. that's, that's like, what it comes like down to. Mike Shula. Yeah. <laughs> don't go to the Giants. Please don't take him. Yeah. Uh, but with an innovative, uh, uh, just, you know, like the, the Eagles mindset where mm-hmm. you ask players to do the things they do well. And I don't believe that he's a higher injury risk. We were just having a conversation on Twitter. There's a few people, and I'm sorry that it's I, – I can never remember the names because <laughs> I have so many conversations on Twitter. But there have been some really good studies on quarterback injury rates and where the injuries occur, whether they occur in the pocket and whether they're uh, – or, or they occur um, as a runner. And I, I really don't think that – it's that outlandish. I think you're exposing your quarterback to injury, whether he's running or whether he's dropping back in the pocket. Every time he's got the ball in his hand, you're exposing him to injury. I believe that in the pocket, you're more likely to take uh, combination hits or awkward hits where you're in the middle of throwing the ball that can lead to injury. At least as a runner, you have a chance to protect yourself. You have a chance to process all the people coming at you. And it just adds something to the defense preparation that is it makes your palms sweaty makes you nervous to have to think about what what are we going to do to keep Lamar Jackson in the pocket to keep him from hurting us as a runner because this isn't just picking up a first down on a scramble this is a guy a la Michael Vick who can really turn any snap uh, into a touchdown with his legs or his arm he doesn't have the I mean Michael Vick also had incredible natural arm talent. Michael Vick can do things that, you know, you see Josh Allen throwing the ball from his knees. And then that's like a Joe Flacco thing too. But Michael Vick also could do things like just flick the ball 60 mm-hmm. yards in the air across his body and stuff like that. So Lamar Jackson can't do that. But Lamar Jackson's also coming into the NFL in an era when offensive coordinators are, you know, Mike, there was a time like 10 years ago that college offense was a bad word. You know, like, right. oh, well, he can run a college offense, but <laughs> it ain't going to work in the pros. Hey, around the time of Michael Vick, we were still dinging quarterbacks. Even 10 years ago, we were still dinging quarterbacks. Oh, he took most of his snaps out of the shotgun. How's he going to translate taking the snaps under center? Now, when you watch an NFL football Sundays, where most of the snaps are shotgun snaps. So the game is changing to embrace the talents of a player like Lamar Jackson, uh, more college concepts on offense. The game is uh, also changing as far as offensive coaching and uh i for one will applaud whoever takes lamar jackson yeah no and that's the thing it's like i i I, right now i have a mocked going to the cardinals but i don't think that's a great landing spot for him to be honest with you i don't i don't i don't believe mike mccoy has it in him to hey he made something out of tim tebow uh, well, <laughs> for a little bit, for like half a season, <laughs> right, kind of. <laughs> right, right. That's the thing. It's just, I mean, there, there's a lot that's going to come down to, but I do want to see him next to these other quarterbacks throwing some of those out routes, some, throwing some of the fade routes, uh, the downfield stuff, you know. The reason I say that is because, you know, you can only take so much from one day. I get that. And some people can have a bad day. But what we saw, like, let's go back a couple of years, Christian Hackenberg. I mean, anybody who watched the Combine... Like literally a casual fan watching the combine could have told you that Christian Hackenberg didn't have what it took to be an NFL quarterback. And yet, you know, we saw what happened there. So just watching these things happen. uh, I think that's the most important thing with quarterbacks, watching their footwork. Now, one thing we're not going to see because we're not going to be in the room is how important the interview process is for some of these. And and specifically, I'm talking about Josh Rosen. Josh Rosen has already talked about, I'd rather go later in the draft to the right team than being taken early to the wrong team. A lot of people are saying that that was directly at the Browns. I feel like he's the Browns pick at number one. Here's the issue is that I don't know if that play doesn't plays into it. If they don't want a guy who doesn't want to play for them, but I think they need a safe draft pick. You know, how much, how important is this interview process for someone like Josh Rosen? Who's had a lot of question marks about his off the field attitude. Yeah, it's important. And you're right. We're not privy to a lot of the stuff. And the NFL isn't always right either. Mm -hmm. You know, Randy Moss, hall of famer fell way too far in the draft. I think because the NFL just didn't understand him. You know, um, we're going to see Marcus Peters went around the same point in the draft, I think, as um, Randy Moss. Now with the Rams, no interest, you know, volatile personality stuff behind the scenes. We don't know. Um, But at the same time, his 
his play is undeniable and how you fit into a locker room. Well, look at the Patriots. I mean, winning is, is a tremendous deodorant and the Patriots have one after another take different personalities that didn't fit elsewhere. And, mm-hmm. and a lot of them have fit well. So th- it's not uh, a cut and dry objective kind of thing, but when it comes to your quarterback, and this has come up on a few shows I've done recently uh, on the couch, quarterback i i'm fond of saying this i've been saying it for years teams take on the personality of their head coach and quarterback so what comes across about a quarterback in those interviews not just in the case of josh rosen where with josh rosen he's and you're you're not a millennial i'm not a millennial he's a millennial right but you know i I say this to joke but like he has a mind of his own and Mm -hmm. he's made it clear that He's not going to adopt this idea of being the face of our franchise and say the right things and and project an image uh, that is something that is you know safe. Let's say, uh, and and also it also indicates that you know maybe he, be, he has interests beyond football, which isn't something that they love. But when you're taking a starting quarterback, your team is going to be like a sponge. Or they may be like oil and water, but the point is the personality of that quarterback is going to greatly affect your locker room makeup and, and your team in a way that other players might not. But I think first round picks in general, your first round pick can it's kind of what people would say about fantasy, where you can you can't win the league in the first round, but you can lose it, which I think is not true anyway. But the idea being mm-hmm. you can't you can't necessarily get become like carried off the the field on on your shoulders if you hit on your first round pick as a gm but if you miss on your first round pick that's something that can haunt you so you want that interview to give you the warm fuzzies you really want to understand that this is a player that you're not going to regret uh, investing in even if you're giving up a little bit of ceiling to get a player that you feel confident is going to deliver so for rosen he needs he needs to make teams feel like even though i'm my own guy i'm still a team guy but for a lot of these first round picks they're going to need to Give, make a team feel like this is absolutely, you know, you know, because you have a daughter, like someone like I, you, I'd be, I'd be, this is the kind of guy I want to marry my daughter. <laughs> From what I've heard of him, no, that'd be the answer. Um, that, that That's just like, like I said, he's just, you know, we've heard that he, no matter, and it's from multiple people. So that's the reason I, I, the only reason I talk about it is because there's been quite a few people that have talked about it. And the fact that no matter who he's in the room with, he, he say he, he'll let you know that he's the smartest guy. And granted, he went to US, UCLA and we get that. And, but at the same time as a quarterback, I mean, I think there's a reason that we all fell in love with Peyton Manning. Uh, you know, Tom Brady knows how to talk in front of a camera. I just don't know if he's I don't I don't know if he's ready for that just yet. And that's the thing is people projecting him to go to the, the Giants, that media will eat him alive if, if he if he doesn't know how to handle it. And that's the thing is just like someone like Baker Mayfield. I mean, I, I feel like he's the that rah rah guy that people that they will get those warm and fuzzies about. And he's one of those players, the combine where I don't know if he could do anything to help his stock, because I think everything he's done on tape, everything that's in the numbers, Baker Mayfield looks fin- fantastic. You know, the people that have the doubts about him, are the, t- the people that talk about his height, the type, the type of offense that he played in. And I don't know if the combine can you know, stop any of those questions. No, he could do, he could build on a great senior bowl where he just showed how prepared and, and flexible and malleable he is. And he can continue to show the, it's that job interview, right, Mike? Like this is a three month long job interview. So, uh, and just the fact that he's being discussed as a top 10 pick going a shade over six feet shows that I do think the NFL continues to evolve on that, that old canard, even though they're loving Josh Allen and his rocket arm and, and his height. Uh, there's also plenty of people out there that are loving Blake Baker Mayfield. And we say, may see Mayfield go ahead of him. Yeah, no, I, 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 I Mayfield's my number one quarterback. I, I do feel like, uh, like Rosen is the safest pick there. I, I, I think Darnold is considered safer, but I, I, I have, I have Mayfield there. I think he's more closer to Russell Wilson than he is the Johnny Manziel comparisons that we've heard. Um, <laughs> I mean, let's let's go over to running back because I don't want to spend too long on each position. I want to make sure we hit on all of them. I mean, the, the two players I want to see at the combine at the running back position specifically is Nick Chubb. I want to see like what I've seen on tape ever since his in- injury. I think he looks solid. I think he's got great vision. I think he knows how to hit a hole. Um, you know, obviously he hasn't been used much in the passing game. Uh, he's had Sony Michelle there next to him. I mean, they didn't really need to use him, but can he get to the edge? So these agility drills with Nick Chubb, those are enticing to me. I want to see how he moves compared to everybody else, how those times come in. Uh, and the other one, Sig, and I'm curious to hear your take on this one, is Mark Walton out of Miami. He's someone who suffered uh, an ankle injury that ended his season uh, prematurely, like very early in the season, he hurt his ankle out for the year. He's been fully cleared to participate in the combine. He's going to. 
what is something that we should watch with Walton to make sure that, you know, it's not like a Thomas Rawls situation where he's come back from an injured ankle and he's just not the same player? Yeah, I think with Chubb, the deal that you think like that are going to be important, but that's not why you're drafting him. You know, that's not why. I mean, you're, you're what, I mean, look, what was Leonard Fournette's vert? You know, I don't even remember, like 30 inches <laughs> It was or bad. Like it was bad. Yeah, it was yeah, bad. But that's not why you're drafting him. Um, and you know, and I got to give it a shout. Oh, by the way, Dylan, I, Dylan D. Simone was the one that did some work in a Kaepernick article on quarterback injuries and when, where they happen. I want to give him a nod for that. And there's a lot of really great work in an article he wrote, um, j- just backing up the idea that a running quarterback might not mean, oh, you're exposing your quarterback to injury. You're crazy. Um, but I, I think with Nick Chubb, you love, you would love to see, you know, how, how much would we like to see Nick Chubb paired up with Kenyon Drake in Miami or, uh, or, or if. Isaiah Crowell leaves like with Duke Johnson in Cleveland or something like that. Although the Lions would be a good one too. Oh, geez, the Lions. Yeah, the Lions. Is there a running back that they couldn't use in this draft with the the state of their running game? So yeah, I I mean, (laughs) but but I do think that what you're talking about here again is that injury and the ability to show that he's getting some of that top end athleticism back because before the injury, maybe we would have been talking about him roughly in the in in the vicinity of Saquon Barkley physically. Although Barkley is tremendously impressive athlete in addition to what he's shown mm-hmm. on the field. Walton, I think you, you nailed it. I mean, you just want to see him show the explosiveness that uh, and, and, and that ankle flexion because what and the balance that he showed on film before that injury. And I, I do think that, you know, um, players coming back from these injuries uh, or even players. So another st- another type of player, you know, Darius Geis, even, you know, they're players that or one player on the 2016 film and another player on 2017. And you want to get an idea of wh- what are we going to see going forward? Um, Laquan Treadwell, I think is a good example someone who had a, a gnarly injury and he looked like he was getting coming back, getting most of the way back. And then I, ha- it ha- I haven't seen him tap into the athleticism, the explosiveness that he showed before that gnarly leg injury, which may be part of the reason that he's still languishing uh, you know, off the field for the most part not on the field often for the Vikings. So I think with all of these players that have had serious injuries, the combine is really good to give us a true quantifying of how much of their athleticism they got back. Who is a player that you're looking at at the combine and you think at running back can improve his stock the most? Do you think it's someone like John Kelly? Well, Kelly's going to be interesting. I mean, I, I think Kelly's height and weight is in and of itself important. Cause I think he, when I look at Kelly, the biggest negative I have for him is just mass. You know, it's, it's just, it's just, he can't push the pile. You know, um, he, he doesn't have long speed. He's not lightning quick, uh, but he makes up for a lot in the way he runs the ball. There's an easy low hanging answer here, but I, I still think it's worth mentioning. It's, it's Kalen Balaj from Arizona state. Yeah. I was going to bring him up next. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's just because this is a player that is going to, from a, a physical standpoint be everything we're looking for everything we're looking for uh, a true physical freak but uh, and also an unbelievably refined receiver one of the most refined receivers in a time again when the nfl is really valuing receiving running backs but at the same time when you watch him run you don't see him summon up all of that physical talent get all those gifts on his run some of that is is a lack of skills and 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 we i think Kenyon drake i've already mentioned i could mention him similarly um you know david johnson didn't also a freak who at northern iowa as a runner a tremendous receiver but as a runner didn't really harness what he had to value but then on the other hand uh chris henry uh from arizona going back about 10 years ago also had everything you want physically nfl drafted him in i think second round titans drafted him in the second round i believe and well he looked like a guy with amazing physical gifts that didn't know how to run in college and then he looked like a guy in all arizona not arizona state but and he looked like a guy with amazing physical gifts that didn't know how to run in the pros so um in some ways balaj is going to get a lot of attention for just the overall picture his numbers uh represent but also isn't necessarily going to answer the questions that we have about him but at the same time the nfl may look at that potential that ceiling and especially with his receiving ability move him up maybe as high as the second round yeah for how big he is i mean he's a big man i think i said what is he six three 230 pounds yeah. yeah uh so yeah he's definitely what you look for is, is from the physical side for a running back is like someone that can handle the workload someone that can stay on the field for all three downs um so i do think it's it's somewhat important for someone like him um one player i don't like that i was talking uh, with mike clay on twitter about and he's on the opposite side it's josh adams i i'm not yeah. i don't see i don't see anything in josh adams and i i mean i don't know if i'm out of my mind here because i respect no. mike and his opinion 
Uh, but I don't like Josh Adams. No, and you're right. And I think that I think the thing with Josh Adams is that, and, and I get it. You know, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of people doing really good work with analytics and and and, and looking at market share, wide receivers, and and productivity at a certain age and things like that. But you, the how is extremely important. And and while Josh Adams was productive, when you watch him. I think you see a crippling lack of initial burst and lateral agility. And I, I, this is maybe an overused term, but when you watch Josh Adams next to the rest of this class of running backs, and to be fair, it's an excellent class of running backs. He's just a guy. He's just a guy. I mean, there's we, we, you watch all the other running backs that you see mentioned in the top 15 or 20, and you see something that you can hang your hat on. You watch Josh Adams, and you see a running back that I, I think maybe can fit in the NFL as a third running back, like uh, Andre Williams, you know, who's now I, I think with the Chargers. And I know Andre Williams ran well in a straight line, even though he's a big guy. But when you watched him run the ball, you didn't see any of the skills to unlock that long speed, and you also didn't see a player with the juice uh, on uh, in, the, in those first two or three steps or flexibility. Or, or lateral agility to hang in the NFL. And I agree with you that when you watch Josh Adams, if we, if we took away his draft rankings, and this is where you started and you're very complimentary saying, I'm willing to just say whatever I think and not worried about it. But some of that is because I think that we get a little bit too hung up on consensus draft rankings and, be, and we're, we can be afraid to go against the grain when in reality we see every year it's all you know we're not always right about who but you know it never falls in line so that the players just produce in the order they were drafted or roughly in order they're drafted it's always very different so you you're you're much more likely to say something interesting and intelligent by saying what you really see than being afraid to say something wrong because it's different than what people are saying yeah, and in the draft, there there really should be no hot, cons- nothing considered a hot take no. in the draft. I, I mean, that's where I'm at is just because talking about the level of competition, the style of offense they played in, the quarterback that they had throwing them the ball. I mean, we can move right there right now with wide receivers. And uh, Michael Gallup, uh, he's someone that I fell in love with when watching him on tape. And it, he may not have the elite numbers that some players do, but I, I saw a lot of things on tape that, you know, he might be out there running a route and get wide open only to be overthrown or underthrown by five yards. And that, that stuff doesn't show up on the stat sheet. That stuff shows up when you watch, not highlight reels. No, no, it's when you actually watch all the games. And Michael Gallup, he was someone that when we when I had uh, Matt Waldman on the show, we were talking about him and he's like, you know, one of the things he does really well is he knows how to sit up in a zone. Like if, if he's, he knows how to read his own defense and he'll sit down where he needs to so Michael Gallup is one of the players that I'm really excited to see at the combine because I think seeing him alongside some of these other wide receivers, seeing him run through the drills uh, and his, some of his natural ability come out while ever while while the feeling lo- the 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 level of skill here is equal in terms of who's throwing him the ball, what routes they're running, the competition, which there obviously is none. Uh, so the forty doesn't. The 40 doesn't really do it for me uh, for wide receivers. Like, like I said, John Ross, I liked him before the 40, but like seeing guys like Brashad Perriman, for example, ran an insane 40. What was it like a 4-3? Uh, but on the field, I didn't see that speed. Now, that, that could be eyes playing tricks half the time. It, it could not be, but I didn't see it. Who are some of the players at wide receiver that you're most excited to see out on the field kind of mixing it up with, with everyone else? Yeah, and this is a very, I want to say shallow class of wide receivers in the sense that there's not, it's not top heavy. Um, you know, Cortland Sutton out of SMU, Equinemius St. Brown out of Notre Dame, and Auden Tate out of Florida State. These are the guys I see with true number one ceiling, but also a lot of questions and reasons that they may not ever hit that ceiling or even uh, level off as a starter in the NFL. Although I feel pretty good about Tate and Sutton. Um, St. Brown may have a little higher ceiling physically. Uh, but lower floor, uh, uh, seeing the drop off in, in 2017 in that Josh Adams led offense. But yeah. th- but, th- but then <laughs> but then you have this massive group led by Calvin Ridley, and Ridley's a really easy evaluation. You know exactly what he's going to be able mm-hmm. to do and not do in the NFL, and and he's going to be a contributor. That for fantasy, I want to make a point to say that for fantasy, la- landing spots get massive. And and as I've been doing this yeah. year after year after year, I think the first Bloom 100 I wrote was in 2006. Um, every year destination becomes more important in my final rankings uh, as far as a, a player determining a player's destiny no matter how I used to stick to my guns and say talent is everything and it doesn't matter where they land but now we can see especially with the quality of quarterbacks and coaching uh, supporting cast that especially for wide receivers it's ev- it's everything so it's a, the next group there's like 20 or 25 wide receivers that are very level and you can say this if you're looking for a wide receiver to do this this and this you want one out of this 
group of five. If you want a wide receiver to do this, this, and this, then maybe this other group is, is more for you. And you mentioned Michael Gallup, and I, I like that one because he's a technician, but he's also very physical and rugged. But the combine might not be great for him because there's not that one physical trait that stands out. You know, He's not particularly twitchy or fast in a straight line or massive or explosive, but he, he does enough in all of those categories combined with excellent skills to, to really be a productive wide receiver. There is a lot of stuff going around now about him being a, a poor practice player, kind of dogging it in practice. So maybe that's something you're going to talk about in the, uh, in the interviews. I love Kiki cutie. Uh, yes. I love, yes, oh, another one. Man, I love this guy. I love this guy. And, and Mike, you know, you're watching and it's really fun. One of the really fun things about this, much like the combine is you're watching player after player after player and, and they start to blend a little bit. You know, when you start watching like Alan Lazard and um, Jaleel Scott and Simi Cobbs, you know, these guys are all going to win balls in the air and things like that. And they all kind of blend together. Uh, but then you see Kiki Cutie. And my Lord, even more than Calvin Ridley, I think you have true take the top off the defense speed, but he's, he doesn't play small, you know, he's, he's physical enough and, and, and angry enough out there that he's going to be fine. He's not a finesse player. You know, Dante Pettis has some big playability, but he's truly a finesse player. And I, I worry about players like that at the next level because NFL cornerbacks are going to to influence you with their physicality but cutie is gonna is gonna be a guy and i like that texas tech used him out of the backfield i think he's got some he's got some savvy versus zone i'm not sure about him as a route runner versus man coverage but his speed is so threatening that i think he's going to see a lot of off coverage or you're going to play him in the slot um there's some elusiveness there and he can he can go up and get the ball in the air like T.Y. Hilton, even though he's smaller, he's got good ball tracking. Um, so I think in some of those drills, you're going to see some of this stuff come out. But I, I think you're going to see his straight line speed confirm what we see on film. And I'll mention Josh Norris here. And I said like, we don't don't count it twice, you know. Um, and and I I think what you're, you're not going to count twice here is we know that he is right there with Calvin Ridley to be the best teacher in this class. And I'll mention my um, hometown Pittsburgh uh, Pitt Panther Jester Weya. And he's inconsistent. I get it. But you're talking about a guy here who's going to be about 6'2", 215. He has a true second gear, if not a fifth gear. He's He is a strong, determined runner who can break tackles, but he's also elusive after the catch. He's got the ability to get the balls as far as his catch radius, um, athleticism, flexibility, uh, explosiveness that other players in this class can't get to and i think that he's gonna look very good when we look at him from a number standpoint and then if you go back and watch him at Pitt and you see him at his best moments you see a player that definitely fits in on sundays no absolutely and that's the thing is like going through all these players and like i think i I think i like how you mentioned you know you have that top tier and then from there you have you know 20 guys that might fill different roles on a team so that could definitely justify where they're going to go in the draft like someone like christian kirk like, I think he's going to fit in with a team that needs this possession possession slot receiver. Uh, I think he could be drafted higher than most think because he's a very he's a very like defined role on a team. I, I, that's, yeah, that's how I feel about Christian Kirk. And that's why I think he's going to go higher than some people think. Like someone else that has been seeing so much hype on Twitter recently, like draft Twitter is uh, is pretty much moving DJ Moore into the first right. round, saying that he belongs up there in that group. And I mean. You know, we talked to Waldman about him. Uh, both of us kind of agreed that he's he's a solid player and that he could fill a, he could definitely fill a role on a team. But I don't I don't know where people are seeing like this difference maker where he could walk onto a team and be kind of like a number one or one B option. I, I I think he's better suited. I would love to see him in a slot role. I think he's that physical yes. slot receiver at 5'11", 220 pounds or whatever he is. Uh, solid hands, not not afraid of contact. But I don't think he does anything like elite and you know we've talked about that is there anything that he could do at the combine that would change your mind on him or do you pretty much have the same outlook on someone like dj moore i have the same outlook i do think i expect him to run in the four fives which i think will burst the bubble a little bit about him at least as a potential first round pick or, or a real coveted player in this wide receiver class because i don't think he has true nfl long speed as you said he's built like a running back i like i think that i i like his uh ability on the short parts of the route tree to uh, he, he can sink his hips like a running back and create separation and he also is a rugged runner after the catch again not that naturally elusive or fast but he can 
run through contact like again like a running back i i think he, you even want to see him he follows his blockers like a running back sets up blocks mm-hmm. on screens like a running back i i i would like to even maybe see him line up in the backfield some um and he he definitely has for his body type better game in the air than you would expect but you, you're not using him on a fade OK, you're using your one of these other six, four wide receivers on a fade. You know, you're not expecting him to win contested balls against longer, faster NFL corners. NFL corners are not going to have trouble running with him on vertical routes. I think he, because of his size, it's his lack of size. It's really easy for the, a good corner to use the boundary at, to help defend him, pin him against the boundary and make things fair. I saw too many plays on film where good corners could really uh, veer him towards the sidelines. I think there's, there's potentially some room for him to improve as a route runner and unlock more of what he has. And the and, and look, there's some guys, and I know you, you'll start nodding along here when I say this, Mike. There are some wide receivers that just you watch the, them and you feel sorry for them because the quarterback play is so brutal. You know, Cortland Sutton was one, Gallup was one, um, and DJ Moore was one. There were maybe some more plays on the field that were left there because I think they were at their, on their fourth string quarterback or something like that. But I, I don't see him as a player that's going to own the space in his routes. And I think that bigger, more athletic, more physical NFL corners are going to influence him a lot more as an outside receiver than they can as a slot receiver. So I am I am right there with you. And you know, Christian Kirk or DJ Moore or I think Dante Pettis is a slot receiver where they land so you know again a slot receiver for buffalo we're not going to be interested in a slot receiver that lands with new orleans oh now i'm interested <laughs> so you know all of these players is going to for fantasy it's going to depend on where they land yeah kiki qt when when we had waldman on i was talking about him and i was like i don't know if anybody else is as high on qt as i am but i feel like he's a player that can walk in and make a massive impact and if he if someone like him went to the saints or a team like that that could use him vertically i i feel like the sky is the limit with that kid um i i, I do believe that and that's the thing is like you kind of saw somewhat of a ceiling because he had a quarterback who can get him the ball he's someone that some people might discount you know what he did in college because he was being thrown uh, who was throwing him the ball so I mean, there, there's a lot of things that we're going to watch the combine. He's one of those I'm curious is 40 time because that that kid has got speed on demand. Uh, yeah. Like, you know, th- that that speed that doesn't take any ramp up like it just automatically it's it's there. It's like a Tyreek Hill type thing where it's like, do I think that QT could end up being a, a receiver like a Tyreek Hill? I do. Oh, yeah. I, I believe he, he may Sean be Jackson. better in terms. Yeah. And that's the thing is, you know, it, it all depends on his offense. And we've talked about that through the show. So I'm glad that that SIG has kind of hit on that in terms of, you know, landing spot mattering so much with these wide receivers that that can help fill that role. Like Christian Kirk, if he goes to the Patriots, which is where I mocked him, actually, my mock draft that came out today, uh, I mocked him to the Patriots at the end of the second round. He might go earlier than that. But if he landed there, obviously, that's going to boost his stock. He's going to be a first round dynasty pick. Whereas like if he went to the Bills, you're probably going to move him down your draft board a little bit. So um, Sig, is there anybody else at the wide receiver position that you're really excited about seeing or do you want to move on to tight ends? Oh, you know, I just I mean, I think it's people are getting uh, more familiar with this wide receiver class. Um, Deshaun Hamilton from Penn State is just really fun to watch as a route runner, as Matt Waldman would say, like like telling a story with his routes. Um, his, his story is, is one that is always compelling and, and very difficult for his opponent to keep up with. And I think in those drills, he's going to really stand out. Nice. Very cool. That, that's what I'm saying is like keeping the names, uh, keeping an eye on these names and like where they're going to go, because some some players will have their draft stock like very influenced by the, the combine. So keep an eye on all these guys. Uh, the tight end one. I have a weird one. Uh, my The first thing I want to see among tight ends, is I want to see the height and weight of Hayden Hurst. And I, I talked about that. He doesn't look like he's 6'5", 252 pounds, what he's listed as. Like, I, I don't see it. I, I see a player like I like Hayden Hurst. I think he's a phenomenal player. Like, I really think that some teams should take the chance. I know he's 25 years old and um, he's older, but at the same time, this this guy plays like every single down is his last. He's all out all the time. He's fast. Uh, I expect him to be one of the fastest tight ends, but I really could see him coming in at like 6'3", 230 pounds. I, I didn't see him as 6'5", 250. I, I don't know if that's my eyes playing tricks on me, but I had a few people agree with me. Do you think that Hurst looks like he's that big on film? No, I don't think so, but I'm not worried about it. I'm not worried about it because I do think the NFL is um, moving into an era now where there's the, you know, the cla- the move tight end, right? I mean, the classic, mm-hmm. um, 
uh, you know, it doesn't, you don't have to be an inline tight end. You don't have to be somebody who can function as a third tackle. In addition, you know, we all would love to have Rob Gronkowski, but or Travis Kelsey, because that was one of the fun things about watching Kelsey in college. He loved blocking, just loved it. And he just had that same verve to his game. But, you know, who, who's the biggest name at tight end in free agency this year? Trey Burton. Grimm. Trey Burton. 6'2", 224. At the <laughs> I love it. It's <laughs> 31 inch arms, you know. Um, so now he did run a four six two. Um, you know he did have really good agility numbers. You know uh, his three cone and, and his short shuttle. But the NFL and, and these offensive coordinators are fitting in players. I've been talking about this a lot this, this year and even last year. Like, I, I would call it positionless football, where sometimes you're asked to block, sometimes you're asked to run a route. Maybe in some of these players' cases, sometimes you're asked to take a carry or a jet sweep or something like that. And uh, I, I think, and the other beautiful thing about the draft is it sorts things out so that the teams you hope, assumption of rational coaching, right? You hope the team that takes a player has a plan for him and knows how to maximize what he has to bring. So I think the team that, and Hurst, and I wouldn't worry as much about how old he is too. I understand why at positions where pure athleticism is, is more of the foundation of at least the high end of their range of outcomes, like running back, like wide receiver, like cornerback. You know, I understand why age can be important in those positions, but tight end is a position where uh, being able to balance all, all of these uh, duties as a blocker, as a receiver, uh, it's, it's a position with a slow ramp up anyway in the NFL that I'm not too worried about a, a player like Hayden Hurst's age as if I would if he was a, a wide receiver or a running back. Gotcha. Now, one player I wanted to ask your opinion on, because I haven't talked to too many people about this guy yet. Uh, the Wisconsin's tight end, Troy Fumagalli. He he he's a he, he was a fun player to watch. And I mean, not not, a, not in a flashy way, because he wasn't the type that was targeted you know, all the time. He's not making D- Dallas Goddard type catches like that's not the type of player he was in college. You've seen him make some some catches, but he's a really good all around tight end. He's got so much effort all the time. Like he's, he's nonstop going. He, he's a great blocker. I, I don't, that's the thing. What have you seen on him in terms of his hands? Do you think he could develop into a wide receiver in the league? Like, you know, a, pa- a pass catcher. Uh, yeah, the pass catcher. And I think that um, he, the, I, here's the word I have for Troy Fumagalli in my notes. Reliable. I, I think he, he's a reliable player. Um, maybe a poor man, Zach Ertz. You know, where he's, you know, he'll catch the ball in traffic. He'll catch the contested ball. He's not going to be a player that rips the seam. He doesn't necessarily have the speed to be a downfield threat. Um, he, he's not necessarily, you know, he doesn't bring a lot of, of, of top end athleticism or, you know, winning the ball in the air like Jimmy Graham or something like that. But he's going to play his role very well as a a reliable receiving tight end, maybe a second tight end or a third down player. Um, But I think from a fantasy standpoint, the upside is is probably limited. Um, But that being said, I think he can become a a fan favorite and, you know, a quarterback's favorite because he's pretty refined as a receiver and and, and somebody that, again, it's like a classic move the sticks kind of guy. Mm hmm. Yeah. And that's the thing is like sometimes we get lost looking for, you know, those guys that are going to, you know, dominate in fantasy where it's like, you know, blocking is a tight end. It's what's going to keep you on the field. It's what's going to get you on the field in the first place. So uh, it's definitely a necessity. I mean, is there anybody else, the tight end that you really want to watch or is is it more of like looking at the top tier guys like like Mark Andrews and Dallas Goddard? Is is this a chance for like Mark Andrews to outplay Goddard? Like whereas like people talked about Goddard in his small school and the fact that maybe the level of competition allowed him to to look like a superstar, does that show at the combine? Do you think that this is a, a point where things can get separated atop the tight end class? It can be. And I think you're right that Goddard's the guy because of the small school. Uh, and also they got um, hurt at senior at the senior bowl. The senior bowl was also a chance for him to do that. He got hurt at the senior bowl, so he really didn't get a chance to show that he can hang. But this is a place where he needs to show that to potentially be a first-round pick. And a lot of people want to mock him to, say, the Saints at the end of the first round, which for fantasy would make us drool. But the, you know, the combine, it's a really big place for him to show – athletically that he translates and i i wasn't that impressed with his burst um or explosiveness i mean we watched adam shaheen last year and uh, even smaller school but shaheen stood out the way that a small school player should stand out like like just playing with like men amongst boys and he should be able to distance himself from andrews um i mean this is what he's shooting for uh the tight ends that i like from a, a, a standpoint of combine can really increase their stock Ian Thomas out of Indiana shows mm-hmm. at times um, 
I mean, I'm not going to say David Joku, like that guy was pretty freakish for a tight end, but he can be the Joku of this class in terms of giving you an athletic profile that is pretty rare at the position. And then I'm really interested going further down, given a name that people aren't necessarily um, thinking about right now, Jordan Aikens out of Central Florida. And you, know, you might have been watching uh, Traquan Smith, their receiver, and you see this tight end size appearing to be a wide receiver, like zooming down the field, you know, um, I think Aikens, and he's also a bit of an older prospect, but I'm not worried about that as much as tight end. I think he could run in maybe even in the four or fives. Um, I see good snap in his routes. Um, I see his. I see good ball skills. I see good balance running after the catch. So I see more than just straight line speed. And most importantly, I see the kind of skill set at tight end that in the right place could really translate to fantasy value as, as that rare big play tight end. So he's a guy that I'm going to sit up a little closer uh, whenever I hear that he's the one being tested or running on one of the drills. I need to pay attention to that, too, because I recently I was late to the party on Mike Hughes, cornerback out of UCF. Uh, so Jordan Aikens is someone I have not really watched much on. So I need to attack him because I'm I'm obviously looking to move people up in this tight end class because it doesn't seem like I mean, outside of the top four maybe five. Ian Thomas might be in that group, but Mike uh, Gesicki, he's considered to be one of those guys that can move up draft boards. Yep. He's a, a huge target radius. Uh, like he's, he's a big player. guy. And I think they're just saying his vert could be like around 30. I think he tested at 37 inch vert and like 11 foot one. I think his broad jump was one inch longer than Saquon Barkley's. And that's, th those are astounding number. I mean, for a wide receiver, but a six, six guy who has good ball skills. Gesicki is definitely an interesting guy. Yeah, for sure. I don't think he's the blocker he needs to be just yet. But again, but we're talking about the guys that could translate as pass catchers, fantasy relevant. He's one of those guys. He's going to be drafted as that. He's not going to be drafted for his blocking right away. Um, but let's I want to talk about one player. And I'm not even sure if you've watched this guy because he's he went to a smaller school. But I'm talking about offensive tackle Desmond Harrison. He went to West Georgia. Have you ever watched any tape on him? Say? Yeah, well, you watch him and he cleans up. And I want to say, um, was he a UT guy? Because I'm down here in Austin. Was he, was he, am I remembering that correctly? He, he was kicked out of a school. I can't remember what school it was yeah, that he was Texas. at, but he was, yeah. And, you know, and, and, and he's going to have a lot of questions to answer about off, yes. off the field stuff. Um, but what you see is like that, 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 you know, just he's an ass kicker and, and at the level he should be, <laughs> but he's an older prospect, a prospect with a lot of questions. So he, he's one with a, a really big, uh, a lot, there's questions that he's going to have to answer and, and make teams feel comfortable about. He'll get into a camp at least. And then we know the ceiling is there. Um, but at the same time, um, we, we also know that teams are going to see him as probably a, an unreliable player when it comes to spending at least a, a draft pick on the first two days. Yeah. And that's the thing is so like, so I try to use my resources whenever I have them available. And my brother, I grew up with a kid. He, um, he was younger than me, but he got, he was brought on a scholarship uh, to Indiana to play offensive line there. So I reached out to him this off season. I started talking about Mike McGlinchey and whether or not I was too high on him. Cause I love McGlinchey. I feel like he should be a top five pick. Uh, but I wanted to talk to him about offensive linemen in general, because I think it's one of the most difficult positions to scout because we don't understand blocking assignments. We don't understand what they're doing half the time. And, and it's hard to know that unless you you've played the position. He was telling me one of the things that people often underrate when it comes to offensive linemen is, is that attitude. They kind of need it. He's like, you can't have an offensive lineman that's soft. And, you know, some of the offensive linemen I've looked at, some of the tackles that I've watched, they don't they lack that aggress aggressive gene. And Desmond Harrison doesn't. Like right. he's a guy who wants to put you on the he wants to put you on the ground. He wants to keep you on the ground. The issue is that and this is one of the things I want to see at the combine is his weight. Uh, because he, at the senior bowl, I want to say he weighed in, it was like 280. That's too small for a tackle. Like they need him to be a lot bigger than that. Uh, he's got the, I don't know if he has the frame to put on enough weight. I don't know how much he's put on since the senior bowl, but he's someone that I'm really, really looking forward to seeing at the combine because I don't think enough people have seen this kid play football. And again, those off the field concerns are a whole different situation because there's a lot of stuff off the field with him that he's got to answer to. Uh, but I wanted to bring his name up. So when you see him at the combine, just watch him. He's a yep. mean, mean dude. And that's why people love Quentin Nelson. Quentin Nelson's going to go in the top 10 because he has that aggression streak. He has that that mean streak that he will go down and like he will go down your throat and he'll let you know about it. What about Brian O'Neill? He's an offensive tackle out of Pittsburgh. He He's only been a starter for one year. So people are expecting him to fall in the draft a little bit. I have him going on day two. He used to play tight end, so he's an athlete. And he like when you watch him at Pittsburgh, he looked like he was a little bit undersized. And that's probably because he, he you know he was a tight end and now he's transitioning to tackle. 
do you think that he's going to dominate the combine because of, you know, playing the tight end position, like his athleticism should jump off the charts, but is he someone that you could see someone taking a chance on earlier if he has a good showing at the combine? Absolutely. Um, uh, Lane Johnson is a name tossed out as is his mm-hmm. ceiling. And I think the athleticism is going to illuminate his ceiling. But even in, at the Senior Bowl, there's mixed reviews. And it's funny because at the Senior Bowl, in some ways, the mixed reviews were based on expectations. I think folks who had lower expectations for him because he's a, a one year starter, uh, you know, just somebody that is making that conversion were lower and they were pleasantly surprised. And then there were folks that were looking at him and looking for the skills, the refinement to say, am I going to spend a first round pick on this guy? No, no matter what his ceiling is, but it, it is a class at offensive tackle that doesn't have a clear number one offensive tackle. I think there are some safer picks that are more second, third rounders where you know what you're getting, but you don't have a ceiling. Uh, But then you have the ceiling with Brian O'Neill because of his athleticism and because there's a lot of untapped potential and because offensive tackle, it's offensive line play was rough around the league this year. There's a lot of teams that are going to be looking to improve. And uh, it's a position, you know, some people say philosophically from a football standpoint, it's quarterback. It's the guys who can get after the quarterback and the guys who protect the quarterback. Uh, and playing one of those positions for Brian O'Neill is a big deal. And, you know, again, Lane Johnson was an ultra athletic tackle. I think he had a little more on film than O'Neill does, but that might just be a function of how uh, short the time is that he's been playing the position. Yeah, no. And that's the thing is like these things all matter. And that's what I'm saying is like cast a, a wide like a wide net in terms of what you're open to watching and what you're open to to seeing, because you might see someone that, like I said, if you don't if you just watch the combine, you might see O'Neill and be like, eh, I don't know if he's got it, but he's still learning the position. It's going to take some time. So um, those keep those things in mind. Uh, let's hit on a few defensive players before we get out of here. Uh, I, there's three linebackers I'm really interested in watching. One I wanted to get your take on because I think Malik Jefferson out of Texas is going to post insane results. Like he's a freak athlete, as is Tremaine Edmonds from Virginia Tech, 19 years old, athleticism off the charts, length, all that stuff. But if we don't see it, you know, do all these insane results matter if we don't see it on the field consistently? Because I feel like Jefferson, in my assessment of him, at the end, I just said he should be better than he is. That's how I feel when I watch him. And that's why I think the perfect landing spot for someone like him might be the Eagles, because they seem to get the most out of their players. But Malik Jefferson, Tremaine Edwins, uh, or Edmonds, what, what's your take on those guys? And yeah. and one more, Leighton Vander Esch, he's he's receiving hype. Somebody compared him to Brian Urlacher the other day. And I, I don't see it. I mean, I, I really don't. I saw times where he misses tackles. I see sometimes where he gets confused by a play action. And not to say that's not going to happen uh, with linebackers, but I, f- I feel like he's a solid linebacker that does what he's asked. I, I feel like he's not going to be elite, but he's not going to let you down. I feel like he's a safe pick but not one that I see as elite. And I don't know if the combine can change that. Yeah, there's a, the, the linebacker class is really fascinating this year. And I think you picked three of the most interesting guys to talk about for sure. Um, Malik Jefferson down here at Texas, you know, a big, big time recruit. And physically, a few of the things that he offers are really ideal. You know, his closing speed, he, he's thick and strong. Uh, he, he can lay the lumber. Um, he, he can be a thumper in, in downhill run support. Um, but I also see somebody, and we'll watch the numbers closely for this, because I don't see a lot of bend or flexibility in him. And I see a hesitant player. I see a player that lacks valid instincts. And like, you know, a player everybody should love it. At, at linebacker this year, Roquan Smith uh, from Georgia. Mm-hmm. I, what I, one of the things I like about watching Roquan Smith is on almost every play, he is getting meaningful instructions from what his eyes are processing. And Malik Jefferson does not look like that kind of linebacker to me. Um, Vander Esch is what he's a real interesting combination. I'm not going to necessarily go to the Brian Urlacher level of hype, but what you like about him is he's instinctive. Um, he, he, you know, he can get through trash and, and make plays in short yardage and fight through blocks. You know, he's got that physicality, but he can also turn and run with athletic tight ends. You know, um, he can play a physical brand of coverage, but he can also play an athletic brand of coverage. And another thing that I like about Vander Esch that I, I, I generally, uh, see is, is just a violence to his game, you know? 
um, that 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 I I think implies with the physical tools he has some some really good things. And I do think he's a player that could be talked about a lot more after the combine with, with his combination of size. And if he tests up, you know, if he can run in say the four sixes, um, you know, that, that's a pretty rare combination to to be able to fill and be a strong player in short yardage, but also be able to turn and run with athletic tight ends. Tremaine Edmonds is absolutely a player the combine was designed for. Because, yeah. I mean, Jamie Collins, you know, in, in recent times, Julian Peterson, a little further back, like there, it's very, very rare that a player with his length uh, and his size and ability to fill out can run and move the way that he does. He just has another gear at like six five two thirty five or two forty he can rush from the edge he's got the length and bend to look like a credible edge rusher in the nfl he can cover line uh, running backs out of the backfield he can turn and run without like players um as a tackler his 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 reach his wingspan is so wide and he's so strong that you know you'll see those running backs like run into his grasp and, and it's almost like you know they ran into a tree branch um but at the same time you see uh not nearly to the extent of jefferson but his instincts aren't always valid sometimes he can be a bit hesitant or slow or just wrong about his reads um and and because of his height and body type he plays very high um, and doesn't generate the power that say Vander Esch does, who is you know maybe only a few inches shorter than Edmonds, but still big for a, a tall for a linebacker, but plays lower. But all these questions, all these kinds of nitpicky things we're talking about with Edmonds, because look, Edmonds is the kind of player that a team can talk themselves into taking in the top five or seven or eight because of his projection. But it's still ceiling more than what you see. Whereas Roquan Smith, while he's an undersized linebacker a bit, is is just you know so. Is he's so fast to process and he has the athleticism to match that and really impact the game in, in every aspect. Um, so I, you know, it's it, the debate's going to be should Smith or Edmonds be the first linebacker off the board? And I do think after the combine, Smith. I would say Smith too. And I would even say, I would even take Smith in the top five um, because I think he's that rare of a player. But Edmonds has a rare ceiling and depending on your linebacker coach and what you're looking for and, you know, diff- teams have different schemes at linebacker and, and, and what their team, what their defense accentuates at linebacker may make that call. That's, that's exactly how I feel. Roquan Smith. I, I, I honestly feel like it shouldn't even be a decision. If Tremaine Edmonds comes off the board before Roquan Smith, you, you literally should be drooling as a team that needs an inside linebacker waiting to take Smith off the board. Like I have him, I think is the number 10 or 11 pick right now. Not that the talent's not deserving. Right. I feel like he's in a class all by himself at the linebacker position. I don't, I don't have anybody else in the same tier as him. Yep. And, I, and that, that does include Edmonds. So before we get out of here, I have one more question. I wanted to ask you about a player. You said Texas and it, it set off alarms and Holton Hill is someone that I watch his tape and I have no idea how he's not being mentioned mentioned up in the names with maybe not maybe not as high as Denzel Ward but Josh Jackson Jared Alexander Mike Hughes I feel like he belongs in that conversation is he going to go underdrafted just because of this off the field stuff yeah I think I think absolutely there's some questions but you just love how he can he can get his hands on the ball um he, I think that he's a player that still has some refinement that can get more out of his game, but but as as a tackler, um, as a as a, a player with you know physicality, um, you, know, you you could see him maybe even move to safety. Um, you know this this is a, a player that one of the things we look at sometimes is uh, matchups. Right, it's really fun when you're watching tape on a player and you see another player. Sometimes you'll watch tape on one player and come away impressed like i was watching dj Moore, and there's a, a cornerback from wisconsin nick nelson that i wanted to go back and watch more of after i watched that and hill actually had a tremendous game against james washington from oklahoma state um held him to just uh, uh four catches for 32 yards in that game um and you just love speaking of violence you know and 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 just um the the Im- impact plays both you know literally and and figuratively um and also the the body type that teams are looking for yes. in the nfl now with his height with his length um you could see him as a, a classic seattle seahawks corner or or maybe um the carolina panthers so i think that 
There is some more off-field stuff that he has to answer, but I think you may still see him get into the second round, but it shouldn't surprise anybody if we see him as one of the best corners in this class two or three years from now. There's a lot. This is a great draft to be looking for a cornerback. Uh, it's a very deep class, and you're going to see a lot of variety in the rankings. Yep. Holton Hill. I just wanted to mention his name because I haven't gotten it out there, but I've been a huge fan ever since start. I watched tape on corners and I was like, why is this guy not atop the list? Like, I don't get it. I look more into it. And obviously the off field stuff has question marks. But when you see him at the combine, if you hear your name draft, your team draft him, like be happy about that because that guy could be a game changer. Uh, and yeah, that's going to wrap up our, our combine primer episode. Sig, I, I really thank you for coming on. It's always fun talking football with you. Yeah, it's just exciting and, 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 and the enthusiasm and, and, and passion that we see and how much we enjoy the reveal, even these little small reveals like the combine and the pages keep turning. And uh, it, it's it's great. And uh, it's really been fun to have the opportunities I've had to be part of uh, your crew at Fantasy Pros and a great audience you have there. I look forward to us getting to, to trade appearances along into the future. Absolutely. Look forward to it. Yeah, go check out Sig's work. Uh, his, his his Bloom's Top 100 is always a wee, uh, yearly read that you have to go check it out at footballguys.com. But yeah, we are going to be back. We're going to do two episodes this week. Uh, we are going to do a mock draft, not a not an NFL mock draft. No, we're going to do a fantasy football mock draft in February. Why? Well, because we're we're out of our minds. But the good news is that I'm going to have Bobby Sylvester join me for that episode. So he's going to be back on the podcast with me. It'll be good to have him back in the host chair because, well, he's just better better at that than I am. So uh, thank you guys, as always, for tuning in. Make sure to go and enter yourself in that contest. Fantasypros.com forward slash contest. It'll enter you in to win that sign Le'Veon Bell helmet. And that's going to wrap up this episode. But until next time, guys, lights out. I just wanted you to watch me dissolve.